Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires that we call the internets is Joe, Crazy Writer. How you doing today, Joe? I, I think we should postpone this this podcast. We, we've got some severe weather coming down. And, uh, that, you know, what? What? That's never stopped us before. But it should because, you know, I mean, you're living in, in essentially a tornado target. And I'd, I'd hate to, you know, come to think of it, it would be kind of cool if. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Let's keep talking. That tornado won't hit you. Corey, don't worry. I, no, I, it hasn't hit me yet. Yeah. Yeah. They don't like pickles either. No, they, I got to admit. Although I have some bad news for you, Joe. Well, I was just going to tell the people here in, in the in the. You know, as Minnesotans like to talk to weather, as Corey and I are recording, it is 80 degrees outside with 70 percent humidity. That means it feels like it's 90 degrees. But, you know, the best part after these storms pass, it's going to be 56 tomorrow. Fall has come. Yes. You know how I know fall has come, Joe? Uh, the pickles are molting. I well, I've got some bad news for you on that front. Uh oh. The, the Gedney Pickle Factory here, hmm? they are shutting it down. Oh, you mean the they're, the, the chance of a dangerous brine drowning is going to decrease? Yes, at they're, the compound? they're they're going to be doing all their work at the Chanhassen Gedney Factory. Now, um, how did you do that? I know you had something to do it. I mean, and I gotta go look some stuff up. But you know how you know it's fall? How's that? Well, I, I had to go to the Walmart to pick up the uh, the, 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 the DC 100s. I and saw the ghost one. That actually is a pretty neat looking cover. They were all really well done. And the thing about them is, you know, it's $4.99 for 100 pages, and it's really well printed. Um, you know, you'd think if it's 5 bucks for a 100-page comic, it'd be on, you know, crappy paper and stuff. No, it's really nice. But when I was there at, at, the, at the Walmart, I went to down to the cereal aisle. You know it's Did fall. You have cereal? You know it's fall because they had the monster cereals. Oh. They had Booberry, Count Chocula, and Frankenberry, and they have family sized boxes this year. Can you uh, borrow me five hundred sixty dollars and ninety five cents? Why? Well, that's the only box of kaboom I can find anywhere is on eBay for five hundred sixty dollars and ninety five cents. Now, Kaboom was a cereal that even as a kid, when I tasted it, it was like, this is terrible. Yeah, it was one of the few that my mom let us eat because they were really big followers of Consumer Reports. And that was listed as one of the more nutritional ones. The only oh, reason I remember. No wonder it tasted like crap. And well, what I remember is just that it, it uh, turned our poop really green, which, you know, for kids is hilarious. It's the greatest thing ever. That's why Booberry was, you know, at the time, Booberry was my favorite. And then they, they got rid of that that dye. And Fruit Brut and Yummy Mummy were my favorite. And those are the two they haven't brought back since, uh, what was it, 2014? Yeah, when they probably. brought them back? <sighs> oh, that was a good year because they even had the retro boxes. They had the boxes based on oh. the 70s. Now, here's a question. Does Joe know? Why did I get my retro uh, uh, monster cereal boxes signed by local comic artist Brent Scrunover? I I don't know. He must have done the box. Yes. What it was, they were uh, going to reissue them, and General Mills found out they no longer had the film for the original boxes. They didn't have any of the original art anymore. So they hired Brent Scrunover to uh, completely redraw the boxes exactly the way they were. And then the next year at uh, the, the, the next convention, I brought the boxes up to him and said, can you sign these? And I knew he'd done it because he posted about it on Twitter. Can you sign these? He was like, no one has asked me to sign those. And he was so happy as he's signing them. <laughs> and I imagine because it's General Mills and they're a big corporation, he got more money from them than he did from Marvel for doing the uh, monster comic he did. But, uh, Joe, what was your favorite movie or TV tie-in cereal? Well, mine, uh, well, it's, it's really weird. It was, uh, well, you know the Pink Panther cartoon. Yes. Well, 
they had done a Pink Panther uh, cereal that my grandma bought me. And she really disliked it because it was, uh, it turned everything horribly, horribly pink. I mean, even pinker than strawberry quick. And uh, the reason I bought it, though, is because it had a, uh, a spy thingy inside it. Matter of fact, I'm going to go look, uh, you know, one of those like nine in one magnifying glass. Uh, oh, Corey, could you uh, borrow me $299? No. Oh, I should have saved it. Yeah, there's one of the Pink Panther figural spy kit post cereal premiums. It, it was one of those that was inside the box. It wasn't. You'd, that was the other thing I, I, I had to do as kids. If they always offered something. I always had to make sure it was in the freaking box because I I don't I always hate it when if you buy five of these you can get one of these free and I like there's by the time I got five, eight five of these things I the offer'd be over and I'd never get it and you didn't Plus, care anymore either because you were just so fucking sick of the cereal well, and I had to get my mom to write a check and do everything and blah 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 so yeah if it wasn't in it 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 wasn't uh. Uh, I, I wouldn't do it. No. I believe that America fell apart the day they quit putting prizes in cereal boxes. They still do every so often, but usually they're in a baggie and it's outside the cereal. I mean, kids these days, you kids in your fancy ways, you don't know the joy of getting a box and digging through the whole bloody thing to get to oh, that box before oh, your we, sister. We were told oh, no. we could not dig. Do not dig. It came out in your bowl. It was yours, but you could not dig through the cereal. And mom would watch. <laughs> yeah. Because she didn't want our grubby hands going through all the cereal. You remember Wacky Races? Yes, I do. And I, I have yet to read the uh, Wacky Races uh, comic that came out a while back. But I hear it was actually really good. I tried, but I couldn't quite make heads or tails out of it. Um, I did. I know Johnny Lightning had... They did two of the Wacky Races cars, which I just loved, but they never did any others. But I do recall, and I thought it was Cheerios, although my search was coming up, that they had little plastic ones that, again, you were talking about getting the toys in the in the cereal box. And uh, I'm just, I'm going to see if I can find it. You know, all this talk, I'm getting hungry. Well, I already ate my – I, I again, oh. they are begging us to do overtime at the office job. You don't – you know, you didn't borrow me 299 bucks for my Pink Panther thing. Could you borrow me $599.90 so I could get the uh, Wacky Race 11 vehicle set from Konami from Japan? No. Damn. Oh, well, back to the Ebays, I guess. But no <laughs> – have you bought wish... any of the EC Artist Editions? No. What are you talking about? I bought you plenty of things. You didn't buy me that. Well, you didn't ask. Yes, I do. I ask every time we do, every time we do a previews episode, I go, yo, if you really loved me. Oh, I thought you were just trying to get people to do our Wikipedia page, which, by the way, is still not there. <sighs> I, I, I get let down by people all the time. All the time. You know, that whole set is 599 bucks, but I can buy the individual cars, at least most of them, for 20 bucks from Japan. Oh, I see why. No, it's the Mean Machine. Remember Dick Dastardly's car? Yeah. That's the one that is super expensive. Oh, uh, okay. Well, here's someone with 530. What? You know what? I'm, I'm doing a mistake here. I need to lowest price first. And uh, I don't see any of the plastic ones from my youth. So, oh, well. Oh, maybe now they're saying here it was a Burger King fast toy. Maybe I'm misremembering. I thought it came out of a cereal box because then, of course, the problem was is if you had, uh, you know, 11 cars set and you got another cereal box and you got the exact same car, you felt kind of ripped off. Yeah. <sighs> I haven't felt that way since I tried to get the Justice League 4 comic set. And I never did get number three. <sighs> ah, well. Ah, well. 
You know, on uh, th- this Wednesday is a pretty important day. I know, trash day. I got to remember to bring the trash out. Well, you might trash day, but also, and that ties in oddly enough, because this Wednesday will be the last all new issue of Mad Magazine. Mad? They're or, mad, I tell you, mad! For the foreseeable future. Well, they said they're going to be doing what? Reprints? Just no new stuff. No, there will be some new stuff here and there because um, Mark Evanier announced that Sergio Aragones is still on staff and will still be drawing marginals. Well, he they could probably just go to him and say, hey, we're running late. Would you fill a whole issue? And he'll have it done in a few hours. I imagine so. But the reason I said it has to do with trash days because, you know, the, the first uh, when they would do the collections. They weren't annuals because they came out more than once a year. It was called More Trash from Mad. Then it became Mad Specials. And uh, then in the 80s, they went away. I used to love those because, I, you know, I, I talked about they had uh, floppy records that were inside there. You yep. know, the type that would anger my dad. Be, I ruined my needle playing that crap. They had stickers, which I still got remains of somewhere. One of my favorite is... Uh, um, Don Martin sound effects, and it's got Wonder Woman as she's tightening her bra, and it goes, point? <laughs> if you remember, uh, and I, I, my daughter brought this down to me. Corey, remember when I had that notebook that I yes. uh, passed around? I actually have uh, Sergio Argoni's inside it, as well as Eric Larson. What I did is I t- we took this magazine. This was based off what my cousin had done as a kid. And uh, he passed this around to people, and you could add things. If you could draw, great. If you could write, great. If you could cut cool pictures out, like I got a picture of uh, uh, John Byrne with two guns pointed into his nostrils. Uh, but that that sticker, and I, I can't find it now, is uh, is in the book. You know, point. So I think, oh, there's one. Uh, fuck. With the arrow going through... Uh, a Don Martin guy's head and his eyes are and his hats, you know, in the air. Ah, I think I gotta bring this around. I'll have people like jamming it if they want. Good old Don Martin, man. Oh, I do have on my shelf, I believe, the complete Don Martin hardcover. Yep, and that's all basement, of his stuff from Mad. And in the basement, I have uh, a lot of Mad Mad uh, paperbacks. Uh, let me before we, we get into the uh, history of Mad. Let me ask you, Corey, what was the last issue of Mad you ever bought? Um, the last issue I bought. Yeah. Last month's. Did you really? You buy it monthly? I don't buy it last month, but um, I picked it up and subscribed when Bill Morrison took over as editor. Then of course he was let go, so I still have them showing up at my house. <laughs> See, for me, other than on volume one, the last issue, which was, do you remember what issue number that was, Mr. Strode? I think it was, what, 524? Nope, 550. 550, okay. Yeah, but the last, I bought that one just because it was the last issue. I didn't realize they were going to start it up again and only run at 11 issues. But the last one I actually bought was the one that Weird Al Yankovic did guest editor. The only time. In Mad's history, they had a guest editor, and that was 533. So other than when I had the comic shops, I didn't really buy Mad Magazine. I do remember buying it as a kid, and you're talking, this was in the 70s, and it was always a question of what was on the cover? What were they spoofing now? Uh, there were times when I uh, I bought Cracked instead, and I still have... The uh, Mork and Mindy parodies in Crack Magazine were as funny as the TV show, at least the first season. And then I do have like MASH and some other ones. But I always bought the books. Uh, matter of fact, I've got the, the hardcover that I picked up at Barnes & Noble, Mad for the Decades. 50 yeah, years they, of forgettable humor from Mad. Where they collected um, all of the different decade books into one big book. And that was only available through Barnes and Noble's um, remainder section. Yeah. So, and uh, they they've had other ones I bought like Mad About TV, Mad About Superheroes, things like that. But the magazine, I just I guess I can understand why it it stopped 
being so popular, mainly because, well, I'm just going to uh, go to a quote here. Uh, when they asked uh, Pulitzer Prize winning comics maverin Art Spiegelman, he said the message of Mad Hat in general is the media is lying to you and we are part of the media. Whereas William Gaines said when asked about Mad's philosophy, he, he said, we must never stop reminding the reader what little value they get for their money. Right. (laughs) Well, I think, first off, you stopping reading Mad and Mad sales going down, I don't think are connected because I think for most of its history, Mad was aimed at kids um, 8 to 16. Yes, there was stuff in there for adults, but for the most part, I remember even in the 70s, it was okay. Jokes about teachers. Jokes about how school food is terrible. Um, you know, they'd have political stuff. They'd have stuff for R-rated movies that we couldn't see. But for the most That's... part, it was aimed at aimed at uh, young teenage young teenagers. That's how I I, I watched Clock. I didn't watch. I've never watched Clockwork Orange because I, the mad parody of it sticks with me so much. I'm afraid the movie just won't make any difference to me. And, and you know, you know what was significant about issue number ninety-one in nineteen sixty-four? What was that? It was the last issue until next month. Oh. Even said it right on the cover: last issue until next month. So, um, what was the first mad thing you remember buying or having? I don't even remember because that was back BC before comics, you know, before I should say before collecting. And I would just pick them up randomly. I would pick them up from the library. Um, I do distinctly recall, though, when I bought them myself and uh, on the back cover was always the mad, the infamous mad fold in, which is why finding near mint copies of these magazines are so difficult because most kids folded it in and they were brilliant. But when I bought them, I would always very carefully do an S bend so as not to put a permanent crease in the cover and try to get the image of whatever the the, uh, joke was. Uh, But I don't recall any, I mean, like, I think I picked up like uh, Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, whatever, if it was on the cover and it had a uh, a tie-in to anything that was of interest, I would uh, definitely, you know, whatever the was in the theaters, I would probably pick that up. Uh, the books I'd pick up too, you know, they're 50 cents a piece. I think I learned more about life from reading The Lighter Side Of by Dave Berg than I did anything else. My favorite, favorite cartoon is the one, and I post it occasionally on my Facebook where he's walking down and he's got his coat on, his pipe, his hat, and he's thinking, most of the time I seem to be, I seem to think about sex. Something must be wrong with me. And then the people around him are all thinking about sex. Pretty girls thinking about being in the arms and next to the guy, who the guy next to her is thinking about a naked woman, and the old lady's thinking about being romanced by Clark Gable, and the spindly guy is thinking about chasing a towel-laden woman. I'm pretty sure these are the cartoons that would not be published today. But that, that to me, I mean, that's probably me now. There must be something wrong with me. That's all I think about. The first one I remember was, and I don't remember how I got it, but I remember as a kid I had the paperback. And Mad used to have a ton of paperback books. I had the paperback of It's a World, 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 World Mad. And I I read that thing over and over and over and over and over, probably till it collapsed. And most of my experience with MAD until, you know, I had my own spending money was those paperbacks because my uncle would get them and I would read them. He had some of the magazines from the 60s. And the one I loved the most, of course, was Bat, the Batman parody. Oh, the Batman parody was fantastic. I read that the same way. I was aware of Batman because it was running on uh, on the independent station and syndication. 
Matter of fact, I think I've got that. Where's my book? Do you remember remember the, the plot of it, Corey? No, I don't, quite honestly. I, uh, Robin you know, was, I, I, I would read it again, but... Oh, it was easy. Robin was, was busy trying to uh, uh, break out of Squaresville because he wanted to date a woman. He said the only way he could do that was by killing Batman. And oh, it, yeah, I remember would, that. He now. would do things such as uh, uh, he blew up. But... Yeah, he'd, he'd give him like a, a razor that uh, uh, that was ready to to uh, his alphabet. Mr. Batsman, sir, his Batsman, sir, this package just arrived. I took the liberty of opening for you. It's a new electric razor. Probably a gift from one of my many admirers. Come to think of it, I could use a shave right now. And Robin's thinking, just wait till he uses that razor. It's really a laser being so long, you old bat. Suffering some beam. Is this the end for Batsman or just another close shave? And you know what saved him? Alfred used it first. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, by the end, when it's revealed who the villain is, uh... In, in the whole thing is Batman says, you know what? You got to remember for years, the so-called sophisticates with Playhouse 90 and the Defenders, etc. They wouldn't even turn on their sets. But along came Batsman and the industry made revolutionary discovery. Give the in-group garbage, make the show bad enough and they call it camp and stay glued to their sets. <laughs> Holy Nielsen, you mean the swingers are really squarer than the squares? Exactly. And, and now that you're, shall we say, old enough, you can start sharing in the show's fringe benefits. Like, why do you think we have these gorgeous doll guest stars? <laughs> oh, man, this is, oh, I love this. Drawn by Mort Drucker. Oh. Mort Drucker was, to this day, I think he is one of the greatest artists to ever work in comics. And here's another thing, Joe. I don't think we would have gotten uh, Dave Sim drawing the style he does without Mort Drucker. Because especially during Church and State, his um, caricatures of famous people, they look just like Mort Drucker would have drawn them. Especially oh, I, I, the Rolling oh. Stones. Oh, they were fabulous. I'm, I'm looking at the Rocky parody. I jumped into the uh, 80s and... Oh, man, this is – I know what I'll be doing the next couple of days, just reading through it. Oh, there's the Star Wars one. <laughs> and I think I've shared with you my favorite, the one that is never, ever to this day will probably ever be reprinted, and I say that even though it has been, Holcomb's Heroes. The oh, yeah, the, I've seen that. Oh, we're, my God. We're at the end. It's like – no. This Hawkman's is Heroes. The gay, <laughs> wild, zany, irrepressible bunch of World War II concentration camp prisoners. Oy vey. <laughs> so Mad started in 1952 from a company called EC, and I go on and on and on about EC, and oh, yeah. uh, almost as much as I do about Kirby. But what it was, you had Al Feldstein, who was uh, the editor of the science fiction magazines and the crime comic and um, shock suspense stories and the horror books. And Harvey Kurtzman was the editor of Two-Fisted Tales and Frontline Combat. And because Al was editing eight comics and uh, Harvey was only editing two, Harvey was not getting paid as much as Al Feldstein. And he was mad about that. Corey, could you uh, borrow me $3,000? What for now? Well, Mad Magazine number one, CGC 5.0. It was a comic. Yeah, at that point. Yeah, it's not bad. the most expensive Comment. one. Number, a number two, 9.8, is at $4,700. If I was going to buy one of those early ones, I'd want to get one of the gains um, file copies. Well, I doubt those funny, you should, funny you should meant that. mention that. For $4,200, you can get a gains file copy of Mad Number 11, graded 9.4. And that's the one with Basil Wolverine's most hideous girl Oh, I'm sorry. It's the most beautiful girl of the month. Drawn like uh, Life magazine. <sighs> but uh, he um, went to Gaines and asked for a raise, and Gaines said, well, 
the reason Feldstein's getting paid so much more is he's doing eight books. You do too because you take forever on your books. Why don't you just toss something out like those humor strips you do? You could do those in no time at all, and you would increase your your uh, income by you know thirty to forty percent. And if you look at the early issues of Mad, they weren't parodies of things in the media. They were parodies of EC stories. You know, you had a horror parody, you had a crime parody, you had a science fiction parody, and it wasn't until Mad Number Three that they did uh, parodies of other things. Joe, does Joe know what was that first parody? Well, it's not really fair because I've got the uh, Atomic Avenue fired up on on Mad Magazine so I can just uh, look at it and go, uh, oh, it doesn't tell me nothing. Harvey Kurtzman did it, though. No, it was, uh, well, he wrote it, but Wally Wood drew it. Oh, Wally Wood drew it. Yeah, no, it doesn't, does not indicate from my. Super Duper Man. Oh. And I guess the first two, three issues of Mad lost money. But after Super Duper Man, sales started to go up. And it wasn't long before Mad became a monthly. None of the other EC books were monthly. Not even Tales from the Crypt, which was their top selling book, was monthly. But Mad, their sales started to go up. Um, Harvey was eventually, well, eventually Frontline Combat was canceled. Um, Harvey gave up the editorship of Two-Fisted Tales to John Severin and concentrated solely on Mad as a comic book. Mad lasted 24 issues as a comic book. And Joe, does Joe know, why did Mad become a magazine? Was the the... The uh, common wisdom is he was doing it to escape the comic code. Yep, a lot of people have said that. However, it went to a magazine before the code was in place. What it was, Harvey Kurtzman, always looking for more money, had a job offer from the magazine Parade, which is not the parade that's in your Sunday newspaper. It was a different magazine back then. So he went to Gaines and said, look, um, they're offering me magazines. If you want to make Mad a magazine, I'll stay. But otherwise, I, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to take this offer. And Gaines, who didn't want to lose Kurtzman because Mad was their number one selling book, and they had cut a deal to do reprints in paperback books of the early stuff's like, I don't want to lose this. You know, this is the goose that's laying the golden egg, especially when the government's coming down on me. Switched Mad to a magazine. It was supposed to be, um, I think it started, it was supposed to be bi-monthly. Then it became quarterly. And because Kurtzman is always late on everything, it's like 1955, there were like three issues. 1956, I think there was one, maybe two issues. And then the uh, EC Comics collapsed. The code pretty much killed their horror and science fiction books. So they started up the new direction, and none of those did any good. Do you know what was interesting at issue 33? Uh, That was the first one by Feldstein, if I remember right. And it was also the first time it was ad-free. Yes. The EC ones had EC ads. And it went all the way. That was 1957. It went all the way to issue 402 in February 2001 before it had another ad. And then people were like, oh, Matt has ads. That's not, they never had it. No, it had ads in the beginning. Yeah. But it was selling so well that they didn't need ads. But after it had been a magazine for a while, Kurtzman got an offer from Hugh Hefner to jump ship to uh, work for Hugh Hefner and create a magazine there. And, but he had a contract and he really couldn't get out of it. So what he did, he went to Gaines and said, look, um, I'm going to leave unless you give me 51% ownership of MAD. And Gaines, who, you know, his comics had failed. He tried other magazines. They'd all failed. MAD was the only thing he had. And Kurtzman wasn't putting it out very often. So he was in a lot of financial trouble. Said, I'm going to pass. 
and he was uh, kind of freaking out over, well, now what do I do? Al Feldstein, who he'd had to let go when all the comics were canceled, he ran into Al Feldstein and said, look, Harvey screwed me. Would you want to come in and be the editor of MAD? And Feldstein worked out a deal where he got um, royalties in order to be the editor of MAD. And he said, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to get us on schedule. I'm going to, um, you know, we'll be on the stands more often. But Al Feldstein had a much different sense of humor than Harvey Kurtzman. So when you read the real early Mad Magazine, they're really sophisticated and um, very dense. They're really, really dense. And when Feldstein got took over, the comedy became broader. It became, there were fewer uh, written articles. Uh, more and more just, you know, comics, basically. They still had some written stuff. You know, they had Ernie Kovacs writing for them. They had Bob and Ray writing for them. Um, I think Andy Griffith even wrote a few things in the magazine until they finally realized, look, we don't need these celebrities on the cover anymore. Mad is selling because of what we do. And if I can quote Tom, comics historian Tom Spurgeon, he says, at the height of Mad Magazine's influence, Mad was The Simpsons, The Daily Show, and The Onion combined. Oh, yeah. You cannot underestimate just how big Mad was. Uh, if you really, I mean, just some of the people's quotes. In 85, Johnny Carson asked Michael J. Fox, when did you know you really made it in show business? And Fox replied, when Mort Drucker drew my head. Monty Python's Terry Gilliam wrote that Mad became the Bible for me and my whole generation. Underground cartoonist Bill Griffith said Mad was like a life raft in a place like Levittown, where all around you were the things that Mad was skewering and making fun of. Uh, even Weird Al Yankovic asked, did Mad any, have any influence on him? And he said, yeah, it was more like going off a cliff. And, and Jerry Seinfeld, Roger Ebert, uh, Robert Crumb, people were amazingly aware of Mad Magazine, and it was the magazine to read. Well, when Kurtzman edited it, it was getting tons of reviews in newspapers and, and other magazines and stuff. When Feldstein took over, it came out on time and it started selling better. And I would say by the time you got to the early 60s, Mad was this cultural force and not just because of the magazine that deal they had cut with Ballantine books to reprint stuff got mad in paperback books not trade paperbacks but in actual paperback books on the stands and they sold really well and Al Feldstein I was on a EC discussion group and he talked about how you know by the early 60s he was the highest paid editor in the world because he was getting commission off the magazine and the books and all the other reprint stuff. And as long as he kept the magazine successful, he was a very rich man. To the point where Gaines at one point said that uh, Feldstein was making more off bad than he was. Do you recall uh, why... Issue number 115 got the usual game of idiots in trouble. Wasn't that the one where they had um, the number one magazine and it had uh, uh, Alfred E. Newman popping the finger? No, no. Th this was uh, at the back cover. I believe they had a dim faced Alfred E. Newman on a $3 bill. Oh, OK. Now, you know, when taken at its moronic face value, there was no way anyone would use it. But back then, they had just started making automatic coin change machines, and a few of them <laughs> accepted it, like in casinos, laundromats, things like that. Uh, and the uh, Mad Magazine had already had an FBI file because they were always doing things like uh, uh, – having a draft dodger card or providing tips on writing an effective extortion letter. So the FBI uh, would, you know, by then Matt had even gone to the Supreme court. Yeah. I just, you know, what had happened with the $3 bill is that the treasury department came and demanded the printing plates, but the magazine already disposed them and they just 
made them promise not to do it again. Although in 79, they featured a 1,320, I'm sorry, a $1,329,063 bill. And it was a twee dollar bill as well. But uh, no, yeah, Corey, you, you, you hit upon something I, I got down there. The magazine been involved in legal actions, but this one was Irving Berlin et al. versus EC Publications. And, and it uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the yeah. Supreme Court ruled in Mad's favor, basically saying you cannot trademark iambic pentameter. What it was, Mad would do these song parodies, and they would have, you know, kind of, they would say, as sung to, and they'd put the name of the song, and then they'd have their own lyrics. Kind of like what Weird Al does, except they didn't record it, they just wrote it. And you're talking songwriters like Irving Berlin, Richard Rogers, Cole Porter, they got torqued off and they filed a $25 million lawsuit for copyright infringement uh, following a sing-along with MAD, which was a collection of the parody lyrics. Yep. You know. They put it out as a paperback book. And uh, the, uh, the, the courts largely ruled in favor of MAD, affirming rights to print 23 of 25 songs, Two parodies, they did not. Always, as sung to the tune, always. And there's no business like no business, sung to the tune of there's no business like show business. And he decided that copyright infringement was closer. Uh, they required a trial. Uh, music, I think, Mad won, but then the music publishers appealed the ruling. But the appeal not only upheld the pro-Mad decision, but it adopted, I'm going to read this off the thing. It adopted an approach that was broad enough to strip the publishers of their limited victory regarding the remaining two songs. Yep. And then as Corey alluded, it went uh, up to the Supreme Court and they allowed it to stand. I think the Supreme Court refused to hear it. So, Which um, has been used as legal precedent for all parody. Yeah. So parody is legal, which is why Weird Al will talk about how he doesn't need to get permission to do his parodies, but he asks, and if they say no, he'll, you know, he won't do it, because I think there was one song that was going to be on a CD, and the artist pulled permission at the last minute, so he released it on the internet rather than on the CD, but there was also Amish Paradise, which um, Coolio agreed to, and then after the video was made and the CD was out, he pulled permission. It was a little late for that. Yeah, we all know how well Coolio's doing. You know, Matt, Matt had uh, something like that, too, because following the parody of Empire Strikes Back, uh, a letter from George Lucas's lawyers arrived in Matt's offices, and of course they demanded the issue be recalled for infringement on copyrighted figures, they wanted the printing plates destroyed, and Lucasfilm must receive all revenues plus additional punitive damages. What the Lucas's lawyers didn't know is days earlier they got a letter from Lucas himself expressing delight over the parody. <laughs> and he, he, he called Mort Drucker and writer Dick DeBart Dick DeBartolo. Thank you. He called them the Leonardo da Vinci and George Bernard Shaw of comics satire. Burns Gaines, Bill Gaines, made a copy of Lucas's letter, added the handwritten notation, gee, your boss George liked it, and mailed it back. <laughs> Never heard from him again. Now, one of the things about MAD that we could go on and on and on about was Bill Gaines did business in his own way. Now, he sold MAD in the early 60s, and then that company was bought by Kinney, which owned um, parking lots, and then Kinney bought Warner's, Warner Brothers, which is why MAD is owned by Warner Brothers. But part of his contract was that they could never infringe on how he ran the magazine. And um, Gaines, basically, he had his office, and he would have a checklist of things that he needed to do. And whether it took him you know, 12 hours or 20 minutes, the minute he was done with all of the things that he checkmarked, 
He was done for the day. He had an air conditioner installed in his office that ran 24-7, 365 days a year. Middle of winter, didn't matter. He had that air conditioner go. <laughs> Um, one of the things they, that you'll read about when you get into the history of MAD are the MAD trips. The MAD trips started, they had a single subscriber in the Bahamas, I think it was. And MAD didn't, you know how magazine, when you subscribe to a magazine, within a month of your first issue, you get, you need to, re you need to renew and you need to renew now. MAD would send out a single postcard when your final issue of your subscription went out. And that's all the, all the marketing they did. So what they did for this one subscriber, uh, Bill Gaines thought it would be funny to gather up uh, artists and writers. He flew them all to Bermuda. They went to the guy's house and hand delivered the <laughs> subscription <laughs> dual card. <to> it. <laughs> this became the mad trip. And every year, he would pick a destination. He wouldn't tell people, wouldn't tell people where they were going. And the way you would get on the trip is if you turned in a certain number of pages and he wouldn't tell you how many pages it was. He would just tell you, OK, we're leaving for the trip at this time. Bring your passport. <laughs> and that's back when you could do shit like that. And they went to Mexico, they went to Spain, they went all over the world. Um, the stories about those trips are just legendary. And, you know, when you look at Mad's artistic lineup, once you got into Mad, your career was made. Al Jaffe used to work for Stan Lee doing um, teenage humor stuff. Once he got into Mad, he just did mad. Um, same for Dave Berg. You want to fire up your uh, Marvel Unlimited, you'll see Dave Berg did a lot of war stories in the early 50s for Atlas. Once he got into mad, there he was. Uh, you can, you know, Jack Davis is another guy who, um, you know, he did horror books. He did war books. He did this. Once he got into mad... And he was a guy who, because he was so popular through Mad, they started giving him uh, covers of magazines like TV Guide and Time. Um, he got movie posters. Think about this. They, it, there were a couple movies where he did the movie poster and worked on the parody of the movie. Um, you know, so many people went through Mad. Uh, Corey, do you know the only president credited with writing a Mad article? I do not. Richard Nixon, because the entire text was taken from Nixon's speeches. Oh, okay. But I, I'm looking at a who's who of contributors, and I'm not talking the guys we love, uh, you know, like Dave Bird, Al Jaffe, Don Martin, Sergio, Mort, but just people who, like, had a single byline. Charles Schultz, who was, I think he was asked, could you comic strip? They'd really like to do. Yes. And, <laughs> which I'm dying. I got to find that. Um, uh, Chevy Chase, Andy Griffith, Will Eisner, Kevin Smith, uh, Boris v Vallejo, Winona Ryder, Jimmy Kimmel. I mean, it's just crazy. Jim Lee. I mean, just these people who, who just had a, a single byline, uh, not to mention the guys who appeared twice, Tom Lear, Wally Cox. Stan Freiberg, Mort Walker, and Leonardo da Vinci. His check is still waiting in Mad's office for him to pick it up. <laughs> now, Mad sales went through the roof to the point where um, they hit their peak in the 70s. And it's almost kind of famous what their number one selling issue was. It sold a little over 2 million copies. Does Joe know what was the parody on the cover? What was the year again? Uh, 1974, I believe. Was it The Godfather? Nope. Ah, Jaws. The Poseidon Adventure. Oh, wow. That was their best-selling issue. Um, sales started to move down after that. 
And then by the early 80s, Al Feldstein um, had a disagreement with uh, William Gaines about how they would do the magazine because he felt that the magazine had gotten stale and sales would continue to drop unless they made some changes. And Gaines said, no, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So he left having more than enough money to retire. Basically, he retired to uh, Wyoming and did uh, paintings of uh, cowboys and western skies and stuff for the rest of his life. Uh, he was very active on the internet. Al Feldstein, incredibly active on the internet. Um, ultra liberal, which is weird because Gaines, you know, when you think about William Gaines and how he ran his company, and how Mad Magazine was, you would not guess that by the mid 80s, he was a conservative, thought Reagan was the first worst, the best president we'd ever had, and said so in his interview with the Comics Journal. Whereas uh, Feldstein, a little to the left of me, and one of the things in the old uh, EC Yahoo discussion group, uh, Russ Cochran, who did the EC reprints, very right wing. Oh, would they get into it? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm talking long three, four page email screeds toward each other. Oh, those were the days, man. <laughs> and you couldn't exactly say, hey, you guys, this is an EC group. Quit talking politics because you had the uh, editor of most of the EC comics and the guy who had uh, reprinted all the EC comics yelling at each other on the internets but by the by the uh i would say the early 80s the paperback sales were slowing the magazine sales were slowing and i think a lot of it was because when mad started that was really the only place you could get that then by the 70s you had saturday night live and sctv and other parody stuff going on then you had movies like airplane and top secret and naked gun and and you could get more and more of that humor outside of the magazine and let's face it if you could turn on the tv and get something for free you're not going to pay for it i do remember when i had the shop that dc comics made a big thing that they revamped mad magazine because it had come they to had their conclusion color. Well, they also had to came to the conclusion that Mad Magazine used to be the subversive magazine that you didn't want your parents to catch you reading. Well, now these kids have grown up and they're giving Mad Magazines to their kid because they know it's safe. Yeah, that's so, what I did. However, I told my son, you know, I was a good parent. When my son started reading Mad Magazine, I said, I don't want to see you reading that trash because it's better if it's forbidden. I'm just going to, for was, those of you watching the weather, the, the storm that hit Corey's just finally made it to my house. Oh, it, it, it was only here for a little bit. Yeah, but, it's just rain. But it didn't but work One thing long. I remember, because that's what got my attention, and that's why I started buying Mad Magazine. I didn't buy a lot. I, I believe I bought at least one, and I had it down with the kids' stuff. And that first issue has the best joke of all times, and if I could figure out which issue it was, I would go buy it. And uh, I've, I've said it before in a few podcasts back, but it's, uh, you know, horrors of the school yard. And it's got the kids standing up and the teachers looking shocked. And the guys are laughing and the girls are going, ooh. And you've got the back to the kid as he's standing there and the headline, curse of the ill-timed Woody. <laughs> and that's the type of, they started to get more edgy humor. And again, I didn't. I don't think I bought Mad Magazine when I had Crazy Comics, but when I had Hot Comics, I always bought it. And I might have bought a few extra ones when, uh, like, if it had a parody of Star Wars or maybe Batman or whatever movies were coming out. But uh, I always did order it, and not a lot of comic shops did. I don't think a lot of comic shops do order no, Mad. No, which anymore. is weird that uh, Mad is going to go comic shop only. Yeah. Comic shop and subscription only. It's not going to be on the newsstands anymore. Uh, William Gaines passed away in 94, I believe. Is that right, Joe? Uh, you are correct. And when he did, ownership and being in charge passed over to D.C. And for a while, they didn't do anything. They just let it keep 
doing what it was doing. But eventually they had to kind of step in because it's like, okay, well, we can't just let this magazine, you know, somebody's got to be in charge. And in a recent interview, Paul Levitt said the his biggest failure was they never figured out how to sell MAD. 1992, Gaines passed away June 3rd. Oh, it's 92. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and that uh, finger, hand giving the finger gesture, that was yeah. in April 1974. And that was the only time William Gaines ever apologized for anything in the magazine. They did apologize for the movie Up the Academy. Because after uh, Animal House and all this other stuff, they're like, Mad needs a movie like National Lampoon had. And then up they got brought in to up the Academy. And when uh, Gaines saw it, he said, this is the worst piece of shit I've ever sat through in my life. I want my name off this magazine, uh, off this movie. Oh, you can't do that. There's been all this, blah, 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 blah. He said, how much do I have to pay to get my name off this fucking movie? So when you look for it now, it does not say Mad Magazine presents up the Academy. And I think the only thing that's left in from Mad is there might still be a few glimpses of the statue of Alfred E. Newman. But when the Mad TV show started. Uh, no, no. In uh, 1980, well, 1980, I see, a few, I see an old one for 10 bucks. Mad Magazine presents. But yeah, the other ones. No, they say Mad Magazine now. Oh, they do now? Yeah. Oh. But you don't have Alfred E. Newman on the cover. It's just a picture of the kids. Uh, Gaines will be coming out of his grave to get vengeance like in an old EC comic, I think. Probably <clears throat> seniors in it. But uh, Mad, they licensed Mad to a sketch show on Fox Network that went up against uh, Saturday Night Live. Never really got the huge rating Saturday Night Live did. And really the only connection it had to MAD was they would do Spy versus Spy and uh, Sergio Aragones cartoons in between. And I think they would do some adaptations of some Don Martin stuff. But it's not like um, MAD TV did movie parodies and TV parodies and, and stuff like that. The only real TV show that had MAD's name in it that did MAD type stuff was on Cartoon Network. I know my kids discovered it, and I loved watching it. Uh, one of the one of the things, and I'll probably say it wrong, is that we this kid came up and he grabbed a, a poodle dog that had a cone on it, and he as he blew into the butt end, it was like dog on my phone, and as he <laughs> as he turned, you could see the dog's face like. Whoa! <laughs> Oh my God, we laughed about that for about a year. Just out of nowhere, you hear dog on my phone, and I don't even know if I'm remembering it right. But what was brilliant was the idea that my kids found this and said, "Dad, you'd probably like this." <laughs> they were right. It was really well done, and uh, they did do some uh, paperback books, you know, based on the Mad Cartoon. And there was even, I don't know when the magazine came out, but for a short time they did Mad Kids, which was a magazine that was aimed at younger kids. It was basically uh, 8 to 12. 2005 to 2009, they did yeah. 14 issues. But for the most part, sales dropped and dropped and dropped until in the 2000s, they went to a quarterly schedule. And... Um, they bumped it back up to bi-monthly, and then sales just kept dropping. And the reason MAD has been, quote, canceled, unquote, no, it's not canceled. We're Basically, they're just doing subscription and comic shops only, is because more and more people weren't buying it off the newsstands. And I've talked forever about how newsstands are, you know, where magazines go to die now. But they were getting returns of 60 and 70% which means they would print 100 copies, send them out to the newsstands, and they'd sell between uh, 30 and 40. So you can't make money if you're printing that many that get pulped. They did uh, 14 seasons of Mad? Yeah. Wow. And I would say in a lot of ways that that and then the cartoon show was what kept Mad going through yeah. the – through the or, sales drops. Or season of the cartoon shows with uh, 
over a hundred episodes. Yeah, they burned through those. They would, they would basically okay, oh, this season's done. Second season starting now. And they didn't. They haven't released them all on DVD, although they are on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Jesus, if I got enough to watch. <laughs> but um. Now, do uh, you think Mad Magazine could survive, or is it time passed? I think as a magazine, I think all magazines are dying. Yeah. Um, I think they could figure out a way to use Mad. I don't think it should be a magazine anymore. But I do think that archive is a oh. gold mine. And they should be putting out books of, you know, they should be putting out books like they did. You know, the Mad looks at superheroes, Mad looks at this. Um, do artist-focused versions. Mad like, Omnibus. Well, they've done um, they've done archives of the comic yeah, books. Yeah, I actually found I have the uh, the comic book archives in my vast accumulation of crap. But damn it all, I want an omnibus. They have they even reprinted, I believe, was it the uh, millennial editions? They did a Mad Number One reprint. Yep. yep. So they they they're mining it, and of course in uh, oh was it ninety eight? They did the uh, Totally Mad, which had CDs of everything, a book, and uh, some mad toilet paper. I bought that. I haven't had it. Now I it's won't... on – now it's uh, – well, when they reissued it, it was on a DVD. Yeah. But I have the CDs. And yeah. it's every issue of Mad as, long, as well as a bunch of, you know, just odd stuff up to when it came out in 96. And it's so much fun. Every so often, I'll just put it in and go, well, I want to read those early Kurtzman magazines because he was doing all sorts of cool stuff. Oh, and the by the way, killer. By the way, the uh, when Harvey Kurtzman left to work for Hugh Hefner, the magazine he started was called Trump, and it lasted two whole issues. <laughs> oh, by the way, if you want some mad toys, uh, DC Direct did uh, did a bunch of them. Yeah, uh, Alfred E. Newman, The Christmas, The Spy vs. Spy. They did a ton of Alfred E. Newman in different superhero costumes. Yeah, yeah, I remember those. There was there was even Banks and Statue. I'm looking at um, Alfred E. Newman as the Ultimate Warrior. And of there course, is, there is one mad uh, item that I would love to have. I know I can never get it. What's but that? I'd love to have it. The Mad Straight Jacket, which they advertised in the magazine. For over a decade, and Gaines said, I don't know if we even ever sold one. But it was one of those things where a marketer came to him and said, hey, I'll, I'll do this for you. Just put an ad in the magazine. Because remember, they had the ad in the magazine for, you know, the T-shirt. You know, here are all the books. Oh, and, you know, we're selling a T-shirt. Or the autograph picture of Albert E. Newman, blah, blah, blah. And I don't. According to Gaines, they never sold one, but I've heard about them showing up I, on eBay yeah. every so often. You should send that into thousands uh, of dollars. You should send that into that guy on uh, is it Bleeding Cool, where he he talks about urban myths and things. See if that was true. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, can I give you a? Uh, I just found this on Mental Floss. Twelve things you might not know about Mad Magazine. Let's see if I know them. Okay, well, it, it doesn't really work that way because what well, they say, like, number See, one. That's hard for me because 12 things you don't know about. Uh, what, well, I want I want 25 things you don't know about Pulp Fiction. And, and I some want of this, thing and it's like, I know all that. Yeah, and some of this even I know. No one knows who came up with Alfred E. Newman. That is correct. Because he, he's been around from before the earliest 20th century. And uh, the, the rumor goes is that uh, it would just showed up. In a, in a New York, Mad's New York office without an address, a picture of Alfred. True or well, not, who knows? Well, what it was, it's um, Bill Elder was just slapping things in the background of pages. And uh, one of the things he was doing, and uh, Harvey Kurtzman said, oh, I like that. All right. In 1960, Mad Magazine predicted John F. Kennedy's presidential election. Yes, and on the other side of the magazine, they predicted Richard Nixon winning. Yeah, so that, that was kind of a cheat. Uh, true or false, Alfred E. Newman briefly had a girlfriend. Yes, I don't remember her name. Uh, you wouldn't, Moxie Kronowski. Yes, Kronowski. <laughs> she looked alarmingly like her significant yes. other. Yep, 
she looked just like uh, We've already talked about this other one. Matt didn't run any real ads for 44 years. Yep. Uh, true or false? And you already know the answer. Spy vs. Spy was created by a suspected spy. Yes, it was um, Phobius, who was a man who had escaped from Cuba. And one of the reasons why the uh, Spy vs. Spy didn't have any dialogue is when he first uh, got to the U.S., he didn't know any English. There was one fold in that Mad would not run. What one was that? Ah, uh, let's see. Blah blah blah. L. Jeffy created the famous fold in in 1964. Uh, editors backtracked in 2013 because one of the works referenced a mass shooting, citing poor taste. They destroyed over 60,000 copies. Oh wow! So did not know that. That would have been a Paul Levitz thing. He's good at uh... yeah. Oh, we printed that already? Pulp and and if, if our good buddy Nick was alive, he'd be able to find a copy of that because he was that <laughs> damn good. Uh, oh, we already talked about their movie was a disaster. We talked about their 1974 cover that had people flipping because of the flip out. Although uh, recently they did the cover again. Yeah. And nobody cared. Nobody cared. 2018, nobody cared. Mad invented a sport. Yes, 43-man Squamish. <laughs> uh, let's see. The field was to have five sides. Positions included deep brooders and dummies. Interfering with the wicked men constituted a penalty, but it amused high school and college readers enough, and they tried to do it. Mad Short up players. Had a board game. Tried to, man. Man had a board game that I own, and we played oh. at the last convention I was a guest at the Mad Magazine game, and um, it was a huge hit for Parker Brothers. The idea of the game was to give away all your money. So as you would land on things, it would actually give you money, and your job was to get rid of the money. But it had things like, okay, trade places with this person. <laughs> so you'd have to get up. You know, They'd leave all their stuff there. You'd get up, you'd trade places, and whatever they had for, for their money, you would have, and it was a very fun game at the time. I we didn't still do, had fun playing it. I didn't do all 12 because we talked about a few of them, but Corey, for the for this shiny new dime, and I do believe I owe you about a dollar twenty. who danced as Fred, I'm sorry, as Alfred E. Newman? Why, that was Fred Astaire wearing an he Alfred knows E. Newman it. mask. Very good. He did it as a dance number in his 1959 TV special, Another Evening with Fred Astaire. And uh, nobody knows why, although he may have just wanted a pulp culture reference. He, uh, a lot of people back then were reading Mad. Yeah. Mad was kind of the hip, cool thing because there weren't a lot of humor magazines that weren't dirty. You know, you had the uh, Men's Sweat magazines from Goodman, and they would have a lot of dirty cartoons in them. And Playboy had a lot of dirty cartoons in them. And there were other publishers who would put out magazines with, you know, dirty cartoons. But Mad was the only one that was kind of clean because Feldstein didn't much care for nudity and, and stuff like that. And it was, um, it, it was okay to read, unlike, um, you know, the, 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 the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Corey, you don't happen to have $42.99 I could borrow, do you? Uh, what is this for? Well, I could buy you an actual uh, straight jacket if you want. Is it the mad straight jacket? Well, no, but the guy who's modeling it looks pretty pissed. It's not the same. Not the same. Not the same. So, um, Joe, if you were in charge of mad, what would you do with it? Hmm. I, I, you know, I, I don't know. A lot of it is, uh, um, you know, I, I know people have complained, you know, well, they shouldn't have gone so much, uh, politics, but they've always done that. Yeah. And, uh, you, know, you look at under Nixon. Oh my God. They went after Nixon in the sixties. They, they hugely political in the sixties. I think I would definitely uh, – I, I like the Weird Al thing. I think I would go out and try to find uh, creators 
not necessarily tied with humor and get them to do stuff. Uh, you know, I was looking, I, I had all, the whole line of people. I saw Jerry Seinfeld mention it, but anybody who's, who's been affected by mad to try to get them to do something. Um, I remember it was a big deal when Jim Lee, he uh, super him and Frank Miller did a couple parodies of uh, superheroes that were rejected. So I think that would be probably what I'd go with. You'd have to find some people who are really hip on younger creators. Or I mean, I mean, like, I, I mean, I, I, I read People magazine. I don't recognize half the actors, singers. You know, I may be, I'm cognizantly aware of J-Lo, Kate Perry, but what's the last song they sang? I couldn't tell you. So it, really, if you're going to go for a younger audience, go with that. I would, I, again, I mentioned Man Omnibus. Oh, I'd be all over that. Uh, and work on some reprints. You know, you got this great stuff. Try to get the paperbacks going again. But you really, really, I think a lot of it's going to have to be driven from your uh, uh, website. You know, all this content will have to be on the website. Maybe an actual physical magazine wouldn't work anymore. I don't know. Do, do you have any ideas, Corey? Uh, I would actually mine the archives and be putting out nice, you know, big, thick hardcovers. I don't know if I do archives because so much of the stuff is very much time focused. You know, the stuff from the 50s, especially the Kurtzman stuff, not only has it not aged well, but you're going to read it and go, I, I don't know what the hell they're talking about here. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea who any of these people are or what they're making fun of. Um, but I would put out, especially I would put out artist-focused books, like they did with yeah. the uh, the comic where they put out, okay, here's a Will Elder book, a Jack Davis book, a Wally Wood book. I would do oh, that sort that. of thing. Best of uh, Don Martin, big yeah. archive set. That would be kind of fun. I would do things like that. The other big thing that I would do is rather than put out a magazine, I would say once a year, put out a, a book of some kind. And most of the classic mad artists aren't with us anymore. And I would say that a lot of the people who work on it now, they didn't make that big an impression. But I would go out and, you know, tap the people who are doing comedy comics and say, all right, every year we're going to put out uh, a book, 256 pages. And send us your stuff. Send us your best stuff. I would tap uh, stand-up comedians and things like that, ask them if they want to write for MAD. Um, I, I recently listened to an interview with uh, Nikki Haley. Is it Nikki Haley? The comedian. And she talked about all the work that a comedian will put in to doing the roast that Comedy Central does every year. Mm -hmm. Tap those people and say, hey, we're going to do an issue. We're going to do an article about this celebrity. Send us your best jokes and we'll help people draw them. That sort of thing. And I would really mine the archives to see how to, and I know it's a dirty word, to see how to monetize it. You know, because you've got, you've got over 550 issues worth of some of the best humor of the, of the last 60, 75 years. Now, you don't, you don't walk through the Hot Wheel aisle, do you? I do once in a blue moon. Did you ever see when they had the mad art on some of the Hot Wheel collectibles? Oh, yeah. They, yeah, so it's there. Licensing, think, maybe. License. I think licensing's good. Um, but really, that one, one once a year, big, thick, hardcover book that six months later you put out as a paperback just to keep first, the, you keep the copyright on the name, and second, to kind of keep it out there and refresh it. You know, grab new cartoonists and new creators. There's so many people out there doing good stuff. Why is it Evan Dorkin in Mad? Evan Dorkin's one of the greatest cartoonists for humor today. Why isn't he doing stuff for Mad? Um, 
just start grabbing these people. Look at all the editorial cartoonists who are out of work now because fewer and fewer newspapers even want to bother with it. They're looking for work. They've got great ideas. Um, I think that DC could do it if they get outside of the idea that Matt is a magazine. You know who's got a lot of good new ideas, Joe? I, I, I don't have any idea. These guys, our sponsors. Promotional consideration is paid for the, by the following sponsors. Our first sponsor is DreamHost.com. DreamHost.com has been with us since the beginning. They're the best web host in the whole known universe. And if you need a web host, and you do because, you know, Facebook, Google+, everything gets hacked. But if you set up your own web page, it'll never get hacked. Unless you kind of make some mistakes or pick an easy password like password. But still, you can have your own web page. If you use the code CRAZY, K-R-A-Y-Z, you get $20 off your first year. When you're at the office, do you often run to the vending machine for snacks? Those things are terrible for you. Instead, have snacks delivered to you. So go to graze.com. Graze.com has healthy snacks that you can decide what kind of snacks you want, how often you want them, whether they get delivered to you, or if you choose them every time. I myself get the subscription box every two weeks so that I have healthy things to eat when I'm at work. You can get a free box by using the code C-O-R-Y-S-3-R-5-P. Matter of fact, use that code your fifth and your first box are free. Again, that's C-O-R-Y-S-3-R-5-P. If you'd like to advertise on any of the Solitaire Rose Podcast Network shows, you can just send us an email at solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com. Thanks. And then you are bailing on me during I am. December. You're I am. hunking out on me. You're, yep, you're, yep. You're, you're leaving me to my own devices. I am. Which is probably a bad idea because I have a lot of devices. Yes. But uh, I am looking for co-hosts. And uh, do you want to be one? Here's how. As Joe preps for Hip Watch 2 Electric Boogaloo, I am looking for co-hosts through the month of December. Now, the other thing that we did last year that I really enjoyed, because December can be a very busy month, is we recorded most of our fill-in episodes in October and November. So, if you would like to be a co-host on Crazy Comics and Stories in the month of December, you can! Believe it or not, kids, I am letting other people co-host. If you have a topic... Go ahead and let me know. If uh, you have experience with other podcasts, go ahead and let me know. But you can be a co-host. How, you may ask, and you darn well should. You can email me at solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com, subject co-host. If you don't have an idea for a uh, episode topic... That's okay. Joe usually doesn't have an idea anyway. I have tons of ideas. And if I know a little about uh, you and what you like to collect, we can uh, do a focused episode like I did with uh, Dangerous Dan Moore when we talked about his favorite character, Thanos. Or when I co-hosted with Adam Vermillion and we talked about his favorite character, Daredevil. So go ahead and email me. I'm looking for co-hosts and I'd like you to be one of them. And then the last thing, because, you know, Lord knows I, I have enough stuff to drop in. This isn't the only podcast I do. I do I, other ones, like insane. these. The Solitaire Rose Podcast Network is filled with all kinds of audio goodness. First, there's Crazy Comics and Stories. It's been going since 2010. It drops every Monday, and it has me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard, and Joe Crazy Writer talking comics, shenanigans, and whatever we're freaking and geeking about. Every Monday morning, it's been going since 2010, and it's available at crazycomics.solitairerose.com. Also on that same feed is the Solitaire Rose podcast, which is me, again, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard, doing interviews, talking about comics, talking about comics history, pretty much talking about whatever I want to talk about. We've also got Solo Joe, where Joe Crazy Rider does a solo podcast, 
and he hasn't done one in a while, so kick him in the shins to get him started. We also, on that same feed, have Solitaire Rose Series and Review, where we do DVD commentary of older comic book series. That's all at crazycomics.solitairerose.com. I also do a podcast with Wolfie B. Bad at badadvice.solitairerose.com, where we take listener questions and give them bad advice. There's also Novelcast, where I take the novels I've written and turn them into free audiobooks. That's at novels.solitairerose.com. There's also Fantastic Forecast, where myself and Adam Vermillion are going through the entire run of the Fantastic Four, four issues at a time. That's fantasticforecast.solitairerose.com. And if you think that I'm on all of these podcasts, you're wrong. Because Scrabbling Across the West is at scrabbling.solitairerose.com, where musician Dave Cofell and his wife Stephanie travel across America and then sitting down to play Scrabble and talk about the day. That's at Scrabbling Across the West, scrabbling.solitairerose.com. There are always more podcasts at the Solitaire Rose Podcast Network. Be there. Aloha. And now we get to Joe's favorite part of the show. No, 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 no. Oh, worry. fresh air. Oh, what? Not where he puts on shoes that make him look like a Don Martin drawing. It's Joe. What's going on on the Ebays? Well, I have been meaning to adjust my jockstrap point. Ooh. Anyways, uh, well, you know, not not too bad. I mean, we already talked about the weather, but uh, and my hip watch two electric boogaloo. It's uh, right. I, I it, it's kind of a uh, freaking because the, the pain's starting to uh, get going. I can't get another cortisone shot, so. It is getting painful. I did duck one worry because I thought I had a hernia uh, because of the way the hyena. hyena. And I actually had one when I had the shop. I remember going in and my left side was just killing me. I I had just come back from a comic con and and uh, oh, the guys helped me load the boxes and unload them. But I went in and I said, yeah, I think I have. And the doctor went in and I don't know if you've ever been probed for a hernia. Corey, but they 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 push in and they they push under your jewels and they, they he got under the the uh, uh, the hip bone and in into the socket and it really hurt but it also kind of felt like he was massaging just a super sore muscle that's essentially what it was it was just a sore muscle because on the other side he goes oh feel that little bump yeah that's a hernia it didn't hurt at all it was just you know I was so confounded by the pain in my left hip it wasn't uh it was just one on the right hip and this was before i i knew i had rheumatoid arthritis so i i, I don't think the two are related but anyways he went in and he, he did the probe and then turn your head and cough turn your head and cough <laughs> like you mean it <laughs> so but uh no the pain's all me <laughs> pain's all me so uh, on the plus side as as this here uh, podcast drops i am uh uh, two months and a week, well, actually two months and five days from from uh, getting this taken care of. So send your send your uh, I would say audition taste, but hell no, just tell Corey I want to be on a podcast and he'll figure out how to do it with you because that's the type of guy he is. Uh, that's pretty much it. And not a lot to not a lot. To, well, other than I had I had four days off. I'll talk about it when we get to geeking, but I gotta go back to work tomorrow. <laughs> Court, what are you freaking on? Um, on Marvel Unlimited, they're starting to put up the Marvel facsimile editions. So you can read uh, Hulk 181, or you can read the facsimile edition of Hulk 181. You know what's not on Marvel Unlimited? Anything else Hulk related? Any of the Conan stuff. Come on, Marvel. Come on. Put your ass in gear. Come when you got Star Wars, you had all the Dark Horse Star Wars stuff up within a month. Let's let, let's get on the ball. Let's get the Conan stuff up there. Um, second thing is, there is a book called The Book of Weirdo, which was by John Cook, who works for Two Morrows. Uh, he's uh, kind of the head honcho in charge of the Jack Kirby magazine. Um, Book of Weirdo, he's been going to conventions and selling it. It's available when I go to the uh, when the bookstore. But I ordered it from Diamond through DCB service. 
hasn't shipped to Diamond yet. Bastards. Bastards. And the last thing is uh, Tom Lyle, artist Tom Lyle, who uh, we had at one of the early uh, MCBA conventions. I remember uh, his one request was for Sunday. He wanted to make sure that we had a uh, we had a TV so we could watch football during the convention. Um, he had a brain aneurysm and has been put in a medical coma for recovery. And uh, Tom's just kind of the nicest guy you'd want to meet. I still remember him at the convention. He would, you know, was really into the football game. But if anybody came by, sure, I could sketch and he'd sketch while watching football. Um, uh, now he he's left comics and does teaching. He teaches people how to draw comics. And um, about a week ago, it was announced that he'd had this brain aneurysm and was in a medically induced coma. And um, I'm hoping for his recovery because uh, just a great guy. And I like the fact that when comics work dried up, he said, oh, well, I could teach people. He didn't whine and complain and kvetch about it. He just said, oh, I guess it's time for me to find another another profession where I could use my art. Joe, what you geeking on? As I mentioned earlier, I just came back from a four-day retreat. Uh, I was at De Montreville, which was a Jesuit retreat house in uh, Lake Elmo, Minnesota. I have passed by it dozens of times, had no idea it was there. Now, I got to admit, I'm not the most religious person in the universe. Uh, and if truth be told, I went mostly because of my dad. He wanted me to go in the most desperate way. And... Uh, Unlike my brother, uh, who just like I wanted nothing to do with it, I was like, I, I could use it. I, I don't think I talked about it much, but I had I had kind of a tough four weeks at work, and I was just looking forward to it because you go, and uh, what it is is they they talk about the Bible, they talk about Jesus. You're supposed to remain silent the four days. You turn off your phones. You don't have any electronics. You stay away from the TV. It just sounded peaceful, and it was it was a beautiful area, uh, really nice grounds. I mean, it was so neat to run into different wildlife. They had trails I could hike. Uh, it was it was a, a good good experience. I enjoyed just being away. I was telling Corey, I, I don't know where the hell I put it, but I have a notebook that I I just wrote in. Where most of the time they're like, okay, just be quiet and and uh, concentrate on what we were talking about. I just wrote and I wrote all sorts of stuff and I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. I've, I've got about like, good Lord, I think I wrote over 75 pages and I handwrite, you know, I and by handwrite, I mean, I print. I had this idea when I was a kid, I would be a, a letterer for comic books. So I started printing in the eighth grade and to this day I still print and I can print the way most people can write at about a hundred miles an hour. And of course the, Quality of the print depends on how fast I'm writing and if I'm sitting at a desk or not. So what I found also interesting, they have these, uh, uh, I'm going to at least see, they have, they're the nuns of Carmel of Our Lady of Divine Providence that are on the grounds. And these are nuns who live a contemplative life. They spend all day in prayer. They make vows of obedience, poverty, chastity. Uh, and they observe strict enclosure in order to pray and contemplate, which and there's also as a 2002 uh, group of monks that are doing this. They call themselves hermits, which was just I, I, I just am amazed that people and I say this in a good way, just that they can do that. That's what they want to do with their life. And believe me, there's times when the noise in life is so outstanding that it, it's almost you almost want to just go do it, just leave and just veg out. But I can't. I have a, I have a different path to choose from. But it was a good weekend. It was kind of depressing to come back and turn on the news. And actually, I haven't watched any news lately. But, you know, you get the Facebook headaches and things like that. Uh, although, you know, you can revisit that every day by setting aside a half hour for meditation. I don't even know how to meditate. I mean, I didn't even meditate. I just sat and wrote. I think I might just do that, though. I'll just sit and spend a half hour and, and just write. 
and maybe that'll be my meditation. There are tons of apps out there. Meditation is really simple. You just focus on what's going on right now. And the way I was taught, it was when I was in therapy back in college, is you just concentrate on one thing, your breathing, um, the sound, the feel of your hands on your legs, whatever. And when you start thinking about the past or the future, you just go, okay, I can do that later and come back you know, to whatever I, you're concentrating on. I kind of, you know, maybe I'm on my road to do that because I know when I was at the Montreville, I did anytime I thought politics, comic books, work, or sex, I just stopped thinking about it. Yeah. I did, didn't want to think about it. I just wanted to think on other things. Um, there are two problems I had. Uh, one of them was with the location because I could still hear traffic. So we weren't so far out in nature that I didn't hear anything. The other problem is I have ringing in my ears. So when it gets really quiet, all I hear is ringing in my ears. Could be tinnitus, could be high blood pressure. Again, I'm going to find out in a couple of weeks. I'm going to go, I'm working with a, a specialist to try to get my high blood pressure down. So hopefully I can figure that out. Uh, another thing I'm, I'm uh, geeking on is the Ebays, which Corey skipped. <sighs> no, I didn't. Fine. Well, I didn't get to talk about police action number three. I didn't get to talk about uh, some came running, a book that I sold. A uh, police action, by the way, was a 1975 issue from Atlas. I didn't talk about the rest. Is that Street. the one with Lady Cop? No, this is uh, this is that was DC. This is Atlas. Oh, okay. I thought yeah. Lady Cop was in that. No, this was Lomax, NYPD, and Luke Malone, Manhunter. Uh, the the book Some Came Running was by James Jones, who's also known for uh, From Here to Eternity, and uh, apparently that's a uh, the movie Some Came Running was also a movie with Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Shirley MacLaine, which is one of those that I picked up from my father-in-law when he dumped a bunch of books on my on my doorstep. I also sold a Rasputin figure from uh, Todd McFarlane's Monsters 3 toy line from 2004. Cool thing about that is that it, it the money there goes to the charity. So at, at this time of the year, when I sell something charity-related, I just turn around and I go buy something new because... Uh, most of the time I wait till right after Christmas because then you'll start finding things being uh, liquidated real fast. I did sell a copy of Lost in Space, Stranger Among Us, which uh, was a, one of the more expensive books collector-wise from Innovation, if you remember them. And uh, the reason why this one was so expensive is because it had uh, rare interviews with the cast. and It's the only book to do it. Uh, when I first listed this bad boy, I listed it at 100 bucks because everybody else had theirs at 120 Guess how much I sold it for, Corey? $99.99. Pretty close. $24.99. Because I did a half-price sale just to uh, have one. And uh, that's the way I deal on my eBay. So if you see something you're interested in, especially as a uh, listener of this here show, uh, go ahead and uh, send me a quick note. And uh, I'll probably do a bargain for you. Matter of fact, if you like, uh, Corey, have you ever watched Star Blazers? Um, I have not because they didn't show it where I grew up. Oh, yeah, it was really strange because I, I got mine, my fix on uh, Channel 9, which at the time was the independent station. But right now, they, they in uh, a couple of years ago, they did a Star Blazers 2199, which is a remaking and reanimation and reimaging of the original story. Uh, by that, they mean Nova isn't the only woman on board. There's more. The ship's bigger. There's more people on board. Uh, the animation, of course, is outstanding because it's today's style of animation. When these first came out through Discount Comic Book Service, I bought the limited editions. They only made 2,000 of these, and they came, and they were uh, English subtitles. Well, Spanish, too, but I don't speak Spanish. Uh, I got the first three. After that, they did seven. I didn't get any more. They canceled them. They stopped shipping them. It was just very dis destroyed. Well, first of all, it's a damn fine series, and I want to finish it. Uh, my daughter found these because I had them just piled in back. One of my – I was eventually was going to go find them. Never did. But I did find that if you go to uh, funimation.com, and I found this website because uh, last week I was talking about the uh, – uh, 
Dark Horse manga version of this. And they had, you can go there, you can stream different videos. Well, you know me, I'm a Luddite. Rather than pay $17.99 and get it on Amazon Prime, I decided to just pay 60 bucks and get the whole bloody thing on Blu-ray, DVD, and digital HD. So, Car, if you want to borrow my digital HD, I'm more than willing to let you do that. But I have the whole series now, and I put the other ones on the eBay. So if you're trying to finish your set of the limited one, I mean, one guy's got one there for 550 bucks. But I know Corey's not going to borrow me 550 bucks, so I figured I'd just buy these. So I was kind of happy with that. Uh, last thing I'm geeking on, um, I really didn't read too much. Um, I, I mean, I did read some things. We'll probably talk about it when we get to uh, – our, our review episode, but uh, level I stopped by Level Up Games again, the one in South St. Paul. They're, they got all their stuff at 40% off now, including a bunch of omnibuses, Corey. Fortunately, they're things I don't really want in omnibus form. I mean, granted, it'd be nice to have Walt Simonson's run. That's about the only one I'm, I'm tempted, although I have the visionary books. Um, I don't know if I – is Shadowland worth getting an omnibus form? No. I know. Ooh, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Uh, they had a couple other ones like that that I really had to question. Even you if know was, what? If you're going to buy that omnibus, you should buy um, uh, Evolutionary War and Atlantis Attacks first. Nope, they don't have them. Better. Yeah. Nope, nope. The, the ones they have, I, I didn't need. They're either uh, – I they do have the Mark Wade Daredevil, which I thought about. And uh, I already mentioned the Walt Simonson one. Uh, there was a, there was a couple other ones, uh, but I you know there, there's nothing that I even at forty percent. I mean I was there last time at thirty percent off, and I was real tempted on the Walt Simonson one. But you know there's there's always new stuff coming down the pike, and I, I really hesitate to buy something I've already got. But uh, if you're in South St. Paul or nearby, they're still doing forty percent off. Eventually they'll go fifty, and then they'll disappear forever. Well, at least the South St. Paul store. I miss the Egan store. Uh, level up games, check them out. And uh, next episode, I'll talk about uh, uh, what went on at the Comic Cons because uh, you know there's always something fun going on there. And uh, I'll, I imagine we'll start pimping the uh, Spring Con coming up next year, but uh, not not till next week. I, I, we don't want to. That, that was just being a mockery of of, of uh, comic conventions, right, Corey? Yes. Yeah. Although I will mention, if you're into toys, there's a toy swap on October 20th coming up in that Bloomington. So uh, that's always a fun place to go. Again, there are people with comic books, but most of it's toys and things like that. Last time I went, I got this cute little corgi that had Snoopy in a, in a snorkel bucket of a fire truck. So, I heard it's infested with raccoons. Uh, the last two have been surprisingly raccoon free. Oh, Although there have been Muppets. So, other than that, uh, that's pretty much all I'm geeking on. Corey, what you geeking on? Um, somebody started a long discussion on Facebook that I loved. And the question was, who are the four most important people to Marvel? Mm. Joe, who would you say? Just well, off the top of your head. Well, it, before I read one of your emails, I would have gone uh, Stanley, Jack Kirby, Steve Didko, and uh, probably Jim Shooter. Because I think, was he the one that got Star Wars involved in no, Marvel? No, that, that was Roy Thomas. Okay, so yeah, I'd probably change it to Roy Thomas. because. Uh, uh, however, I would probably take one of those names out, maybe the last one, and put Marv, our Goodman buddy. Because uh, he was the cheap bastard that kept it going the whole time. See, the thing uh, that I did... That was after talking to you. What I did, which completely changed the discussion, Ooh. which is what I do. <laughs> I, the four most important people to Marvel, Martin Goodman, who created it, Jim Galton, who took over in the 70s and kept it until the 80s. Is that Candy's Industries? Yes. I thought so. Isaac Perlmutter. Who saved it and brought in the era of movies. And uh, Bob Iger. Who's I, the, uh, I draw a blank. He's the head of Disney. Oh, these are the people, you know, Stan did good stuff. 
Jack did amazing stuff. Did, did Roy Thomas, you could say Bill Everett, you could say Carol Burgos, you could say um, Joe Manili, uh, you could say Al Fago, who was the editor in the in the late 40s. But without those four guys, we wouldn't have Marvel. Because uh, Martin Goodman, he's the one who started it and was you know the owner. And then Jim Galton is the guy who kind of took over with Candace Industries and brought Marvel out of losing millions of dollars a year in the 70s. Isaac Perlmutter's the guy who owned it and brought it out of the bankruptcy of the 90s, even though he's kind of involved in putting it in the bankruptcy. But he's also the one who finally okayed them having their own movie studio. And now Bob Iger's the one who's basically taken it and made it one of the most successful worldwide brands in history. If you look at the top 10 movies of the year, Disney has seven of the top 10. And the very top, I think, three, no, three of the top four are Marvel movies. Now, you did catch uh, what the news that broke. And I think you called it already. Well, oh, Sony, yeah. Sony and Marvel agree to pretty much what we thought they'd agree to. They're going to yeah. share money. Uh, Kevin's going to be involved. Uh, the whole thing I thought that was interesting through the discussion, I don't know if you brought it up or somebody else. If Sony sells, Marvel gets to write the Spider-Man back. Yeah. And so I think it behooved Sony to make this agreement because there are people sniffing around Sony's doorstep. They want the content that Sony produces. Apple is one of them. So we may see more from the Sony Spider-Man story, but for now, all is well. No need to panic. And the other thing is, if you read um, what Hollywood Reporter said, basically, Sony uh, caved as soon as Disney released the story. So remember when I said, oh, this is all a negotiating tactic? It was a negotiating tactic. Listen to your uncle, rat bastard. I know how this stuff works. Um, Joe, you don't have cable, do you? I do not. I feel bad for you because... Um, well, Turner Classic Movies no longer has the uh, the exclusive rights to the Universal Monster movies. So that's why you see them on Spanguli and in other places. But guess what they're doing every Friday night in October? Monster time. More specific. That's about as specific as I can get. History shows again and again how nature points out the folly of men. Well, while you're busy watching, Godzilla! You, can, you can borrow me the complete set you scammed out of Best Buy. No, no, no. That's what it is. These are the Godzilla movies before that set. Ooh, I thought it was a complete set. No, no. The uh, the set I got is all of the movies from Godzilla 1985 till um, Godzilla Final Battle. The ones before that. Those are going to be in the uh, very expensive Criterion set that will go for around $170. So when uh, Criterion has their next half price sale, buying the hell out of that. But they're going to show them all on Turner Classic Movies. They're showing like four every Friday night in October. So uh, don't don't bother to uh, don't don't bother calling on Friday. Okay. Well, um, comic. When you see the Criterion go on sale, give me a yell because I'd like a piece of that action. Oh yeah. Um, Comic-wise, uh, more of the, uh, I call them the nostalgia pop books came out, and the one that I read that I fell in love with was uh, New Mutants, written by Chris Claremont and drawn by Bill Sienkiewicz. And Claremont said that he would happily do more. And I guess when uh, he got the go-ahead to do a New Mutant story, he called Bill Sienkiewicz, who said, you know, didn't even need to know the plot, didn't know anything, said, yep, I'm in. <laughs> and I read it. It is so damn good. It reminds me of why that book blew me away back in the 80s. Ah. And the last thing I'm geeking on, they have announced the um, people who will go in the Harvey Awards Hall of Fame. Now, what is it? Uh, the the Eisner Awards 
are the ones that are done by the San Diego Comic Con. The Harvey Awards are based on Har- are named after Harvey Kurtzman, who creator of Mad. See, it all ties in. It all ties it in. It does. And the people that they've named for their Hall of Fame are Mike Mignola for Hellboy, Allison Bechtel, who's done a number of indie books and created the uh, what is it, the Bechtel scale which is does a movie or tv show have two female characters talking about something other than a man and will elder jack davis john severin marie severin and ben oda all of which worked for ec ben oda was the only letterer at ec because harvey kurtzman would not use the leroy lettering leroy lettering was kind of a mechanical editing lettering that was used on all of Feldstein's books and even in Mad, but Kurtzman wanted the hand lettering, so Ben Oda did the lettering. So those five people are being inducted into the Hall of Fame. The only problem I have with that is why weren't they in the Hall of Fame a lot sooner? Um, You can't go wrong with Bill Elder, Jack Davis, John Severin, Marie Severin, and Ben Oda. They were monsters of the comic field. Anybody who worked at EC turned out their best work while working for EC. And I just cannot go on about it long enough. Believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us blather on for the last hour and a half. Corey, will you think less of me because I bought a complete set of Major X? No. Okay, good. I I would think less of you if if, I read it. If you said this is the greatest comic ever. Well, I haven't read it yet. Okay. And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you like the most, Joe. So two priests, you know I got a lot of priest jokes now. Two priests show up at the pearly gates, and when they get there, St. Peter has to, as bad news, because as you know, heaven has been trying to uh, update and use computers and things, but their first time their server crashed. This wasn't reported on Vatican radio or in the Vatican news or anything, but so say Peter looked at the two priests and said, you know, I'm really sorry. I can't let you in right now, but I'll, I'll make it up to you. You may go back to earth for 24 hours as anything you want. And the first priest thought, well, you know what? I've always wanted to be able to fly. I would like to go back with, and be able to fly. Priest disappears. Second priest comes up. St. Peter looks at him. What what would you like? And he goes, well, you know, I've been a priest a long time. And I've had a vow of chastity the whole time. I think I'd like to go back and be a stud. Yeah. He disappears. Just then the IT angel comes up and says, okay, we're ready. We got everything online. St. Peter sighs and says, no, I sent him back to earth for 24 hours. He says, well, we got to get them back where are they well says saint peter the first priest is somewhere over the rocky mountains is a bald eagle flying majestically it should be pretty easy to spot well that's fine saint peter but what about the second one? Oh, he's on a snow tire in north dakota Corey, hit my music <laughs> 